Hello, my name is Chris Enroth, and I'm a horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension. Following is the final session of our community garden webinar series with the topic being safe harvest practices. Uh, we are going to be addressing two types of community gardens. One being a conventional community garden where members rent plots to grow vegetables for their own use. And the second type is a community garden, or as I like to say, a garden for the community where volunteers grow food to donate to local food assistance programs. Both types of community gardens must address safe harvesting practices and you as the community garden manager or the volunteer leader must develop a plan to address the issues we will discuss. What we will examine for the next 20 minutes or so are how we can identify the risks within our community garden and then develop policies to reduce those risks. And we'll discuss what types of equipment and facilities are going to be necessary in a community garden to reduce those risks. Uh, it's also our hope that you will use this resource and others to develop a training program for all community garden members or the volunteers so that everybody is included in the risk reduction. The last thing you want is a community garden member or volunteer putting themselves or others at risk. So even if you plan have a plan, as uh, it seems this gentleman here does on the slide, I mean, it must be quite an elaborate setup here for him to be able to reach underneath his roof right there. Does this plan reduce the risk? And so that's what we're going to talk about today, putting together a good plan and some good practices for your community garden. We are going to cover some items that may scare the pants off of anyone involved in a donation community garden. One thing I would like you to keep in mind, though, is that your good intentions are protected by the law. The Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act encourages the donation of food to nonprofit organizations. So this is a great law. Uh, it essentially states that a person who is donating produce will only be found liable if they are grossly negligent with the intention to do harm to others. So as an example, if a gardener takes raw human sewage and throws it on their vegetables, fully aware of the health risk associated with that action, and then goes and donates that produce and people get sick, that they are obviously um, grossly negligent. Uh, they are doing harm to others because they, they are knowingly doing it. Um, when I read through the, uh, the Bill Emerson Act, Pretty much the, the two key takeaways I would like to convey to you is that, you know, in general, you know, don't donate produce out of your garden that you wouldn't otherwise buy for your own family. Also, if pesticides are used in your community garden, make sure you follow the labels for their pre-harvest intervals. And if you're out there picking tomatoes or peppers or lettuce or something and you're not sure, maybe you see bird droppings or did somebody put some fresh manure right there? If you're not sure, just discard that produce and play it safe. What sets fresh produce apart from all the other foods that we tend to find in the grocery store? Well, let's compare chicken to lettuce. It is common knowledge that chicken has a high probability of contamination of pathogens that are going to harm our human health. However, lettuce is unlikely to be contaminated. In terms of processing interventions or how the product is handled upon sale, uh, you know, it, that's very good for chicken. Those handling the chicken, they wear gloves, the butchering area is routinely clean, and the chicken is always wrapped in plastic and labeled very nicely. Lettuce, well, it's stocked in open air containers, placed on the shelf where anybody can come by, pick up the lettuce, look it over, put it back, sneeze on it, whatever. The consumer retailer interventions, they are also excellent when it comes to raw chicken. In addition to specific cooking instructions on the label, many grocers have information near meat counters that indicate proper cooking of specific meats. Not many consumers know that you should always wash produce before eating it. However, fresh greens like lettuce are rising in popularity. Uh, people are realizing that there's more to lettuce than just uh, iceberg. And of course, nobody eats raw chicken, at least not on purpose. Lettuce is, of course, nearly always eaten raw. 
If we examine what type of produce carries the highest number of foodborne illness outbreaks from 2000 to 2011, leafy greens, uh, second to sprouts, are one of the highest reported cases. The conclusion that we can draw from this chart is that contamination can happen to any type of produce. Therefore, pre preventing contamination is critical in all fruit and vegetable crops. Very quickly, what pathogens are common causes of foodborne illness in produce? Well, salmonella by far is the most common, followed by E. coli. Now, these are usually the headline makers, the ones that we often see, but produce can also become contaminated with other human pathogens such as listeria or hepatitis A. While the previous slides showed us a percent of the whole, here is the physical data, the numbers indicating illnesses, hospitalizations, and death uh, due to produce-associated outbreaks. Though most people will only experience minor symptoms like diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting, there are others that have more serious symptoms, and you know, oftentimes that might result in hospitalization, long-term health impacts, and even death. So keep in mind the number of illnesses are likely much higher in the real world due to the underreporting of cases of foodborne illness because even though I know I have gotten food poison before I've probably I don't think I've ever gone to the hospital because of that you just kind of suffer it out at home. So if you, um, you those last couple slides really scared you you're not sure if you want to keep going just know there is no way to guarantee that everything we grow and consume is free of harmful microbial contamination. This is true no matter what, how, or where it is grown. So the bottom line is the risk can be reduced if we take preventative steps before that produce is consumed. So that last couple of minutes is just kind of an intro, a primer to why this uh, material is important. Now we are going to examine the best practices to reduce risks when dealing with harvested produce. Assessing risks associated with produce safety requires a systematic review of your garden location, your practices, and any you know typical situations to determine where contamination could most easily occur. Uh, many situations and risks will be discussed during this module here, but your garden has its own unique risks. So focus on learning how you can assess these risks so you can evaluate your own growing system. Thus far, we've concentrated on the microbial risks, but it's important to know that there are chemical and physical risks too. Examples of chemical risk would be high levels of lead in the soil, a big problem in urban uh, gardens and landscapes. Physical risks could be broken glass in the growing area, which might accidentally end up in a bag of potatoes. So think about the location of your garden and what was the historic use of your site, plus what are the land activities that are surrounding your, uh, your site, your, your garden there. Contamination from livestock and wildlife, manures, hygiene, and uh, best practices for production to post-harvest, and uh, planning for kind of those atypical situations uh, we're going to cover uh, all this and more. Standard operating procedures can help you implement safe harvest practices in your community garden and ensure that these practices are being done properly. So think of a standard operating procedure or SOP as a recipe card. It provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to complete a task that needs to be done so uh, we can harvest produce safely. It also includes where the supplies are located in order for someone to complete a task and also how often that task should be done. So try writing a simple SOP for your community garden and then give it to someone who has never done that task before and watch what they do. Do they do it correctly? Were they confused at any point about the instructions or location of supplies? If so, revise the SOP to be more clear. And as you progress through the following slides, start to think about where SOPs might be useful to implement in your own community garden. And these don't always have to be written documents. These can also be visual SOPs. As you can see in the picture here is uh, an image of what the post-harvest station should look like. 
after folks have used it and everything has been cleaned up and all the materials are placed back where they're supposed to be. One of the best practices is keeping records. What records you keep will depend on the type of community garden you have. So for donation community gardens, your primary records will be documenting your practices, such as what you grew, how much of each type of produce was donated, and did your volunteers complete the uh, safe harvest practices training, what type of soil amendments did you use, uh, and when, fertilizer supplied, and so on. On the other hand, community garden managers, where you're uh, taking care of individual plots that folks are renting, will need to keep records more on the people who are renting the plots. You're going to want to know what they're growing, are they following the SOPs, and have there been any issues that have arisen from their participation in the community garden, and so on. From here on, I've divided the remainder of the session into five key best practice areas. We're looking at proper hygiene, soil amendments, water, wildlife and domestic animals, and post-harvest handling of produce. And so now let's start with proper hygiene. Why is hygiene an issue? Well, garden volunteers or community garden members are a food safety concern because they can carry pathogens, they can spread pathogens, and they all require training in order to reduce that risk. So primary training should revolve around proper hand washing, which we're going to cover in a lot more detail in just a second here, and also how to handle injuries. Uh, you know, at our community garden, we've had a couple injuries actually in, over the last year or two, and I really want to stress every community garden needs to have a first aid kit on hand. Uh, and should anyone be injured uh, and you know or cut, and if blood comes into contact with any of the produce that produce needs to be discarded. There's no amount of cleaning that's going to get that blood off of there. Any surface that has come into contact with blood also needs to be cleaned thoroughly and sanitized. When it comes to hygiene uh, and the community garden training program that I really feel is a necessity for your members or volunteers, make sure to include how to properly wash hands and, and above all stress the importance of personal cleanliness. Also make sure that you have a policy of what to do when somebody is injured or ill. You know, if you have a volunteer who's not feeling well and they still feel as though they need to come and show up to harvest vegetables, to donate to food pantries, give them a job that doesn't involve handling the produce. Maybe cleaning out um, wheelbarrows or you know, moving, moving some materials around, but nothing that involves handling the, the food. And then also make sure to leave yourself open to communication from community guard members or volunteers so that they can report to you any food safety risks that they observe. When should hands be washed? It kind of seems like common knowledge. However, there are different lifestyle habits and there's also different cultural norms in the United States. But essentially hands should be washed, um, you know, based on the, everything on this list. After using the toilet, uh, before starting or returning to work in the garden, before or after eating uh, or smoking. Basically, anytime you do something that involves your hand coming into contact with your mouth. Also, before putting on gloves or after touching animals or in any other time where you feel your hands might become contaminated, such as when you would be applying pesticides. I know I'm really stressing um, proper hand washing, but I really do feel it should be included in all community garden training programs. Uh, so, you know, instruct your members or volunteers how to properly wash their hands, uh, wet your hands with water, uh, apply soap and lather, be sure to wash the fronts, backs of hands, and, and this is the key thing, rub hands together for at least 20 seconds. Uh, what can you do for 20 seconds? Sing the ABCs. I like to hum the first few lines of Led Zeppelin's Black Dog. And then after that, rinse thoroughly with clean water, dry with a paper towel, and then throw it in uh, the trash can uh, and, and make sure that it is a setup where you don't have to touch any potentially contaminated surfaces once you've washed your hands. Uh, if you don't have very good hand washing uh, uh, space available, single-use disposable gloves can be used for harvesting, uh, but that is not an ideal situation. Safe soil amendments. Uh, soil amendments are commonly used in the production of fresh fruits and vegetables. 
focus of this section is on assessing the risk and ways to reduce the risk associated with soil amendments. So uh, when we look at the types of soil amendments out there, manures, uh, raw or composted, uh, these tend to be widely available. Uh, they're used quite often. They t they're cost-effective soil amendments. There are food safety risks if manure is managed improperly. So I always say if you're using uh, manure, know your source. When it comes to chemical soil amendments, uh, these tend to be low risk for curing human pathogens. However, these they're not 100% safe and can still harm the environment or applicator if used improperly. We also have green wastes, and these are uh, could be food waste, landscape or yard trimmings, municipal uh, compost. Um, these are not considered also zero risk. They could carry chemical, physical, or biological hazards. Biosolids, uh, this category often includes human waste, which cannot be used on crops unless it meets, meets uh, very rigorous EPA regulations for biosolids. Then we have manufacturing byproducts, and examples of these are bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, or fish emulsion. Uh, these are typically processed in a way that reduces or eliminates any pathogens. Uh, and they tend to be a lower risk than raw amendments, especially uh, the manures. Other things to think about when you apply a, a soil amendment is when do you apply them? And, and so you're kind of counting back days to harvest and you really need to if you're using fresh manure you really should do that in the fall when there are no crops in the ground let that rest over the winter into the spring um, but if you're going to be applying fresh manure into a, a garden bed you really need to do it 120 days before any type of harvest is going to be occurring in that garden When it comes to high-risk uh, soil amendments, uh, these are predominantly manures, uh, mostly untreated manures, raw manure, uh, manure slurries, manure teas, uh, any amendment that has been mixed with raw manure, and also aged or stacked manure piles. And, and this is essentially uh, uh, aged or stacked manure if you take like a bedding from a horse's stall and just dump it in a pile and it sits there. You don't actually manage it by turning it and monitoring the internal temperature. That's still considered pretty much an untreated manure pile. Uh, we also do have compost teas that have been uh, supplemented with microbial nutrients uh, where we might be fermenting the compost tea for certain biological activity. We can also get negative um, microbes in with some of those positive ones. Essentially for community gardens, uh, really want to discourage the use of raw manure. I know that's something we would never use in our community garden here in Macomb. To minimize the potential for cross-contamination, specific equipment and tools need to be designated for use in handling soil amendments. So as you can see in the image below, at our community garden, uh, the blue buckets are used for handling harvested produce. The blue buckets are cleaned out after each time we use them. They're spick and span spotless. All the other buckets, buckets, be they orange, green, or white, are used in production practices like carrying compost or mixing our soil amendments and fertilizers and, and, and so on. If tools and equipment that contact soil amendments will also be used in the garden, you really should develop some type of procedure to have that equipment clean before it, it goes into an area where you're going to be having harvested uh, produce. So, so for example, if you have a rake which you use to turn an active compost pile, it could be a compost pile of manure or yard waste, before you take that rake into the garden, make sure that there's some procedure in place that that rake is cleaned so you don't want to spread any potential contaminants into your uh, garden. You also want to direct any kind of uh, vehicle or foot traffic away from uh, your soil amendment handling and loading area where you have the piles at so that you reduce the chances of tracking any contamination uh, throughout the garden. So don't place a manure pile along the entry path to your garden where anyone is going to be walking in and could potentially contaminate produce. In that same vein of thinking, don't place manure piles uphill of your garden where, say, stormwater runoff could wash off and contaminate your garden beds. 
Uh, also, keep raw manure away from finished compost. Keep them separate. And make sure to designate equipment, such as buckets or wheelbarrows, for each pile. Don't dump a pile of fresh manure from the horse stall and then go load up uh, in the same container of finished compost to go spread on top of your spinach. Let's switch now to uh, safe water, water use in the community garden. Uh, from a grower standpoint, they really see water as, as two types. You have production water, what you use to irrigate the crop when it's growing, and then we have the post-harvest water to clean it after we've picked it and it's out of the field. For our situation here in our community garden, uh, our, we're using the same source of water for this. Uh, so our irrigation water in this photo here uh, is the, the black uh, tubing here, which goes into the irrigation system. And then our post-harvest water is the blue hose, which we drag over to our wash table and, and we use that to wash our water. So it all comes from the same spot. Um, but uh, depending on, on your setup, it, it might be different. And so just something to keep in mind. As you assess the risk of water in your community garden, the first thing to consider is what is your water source? Uh, how often is that water tested, if at all? If you've been submitting water samples for testing, where at in your water system did you take the sample? Could contamination be elsewhere in the system? Next, how is water applied to crops? Is it directly applied? Or, uh, you know, as, as you might see in an overhead irrigation system, uh, it's probably going to be the most common case for uh, most community gardens. Or is it indirectly applied via drip irrigation, where water drips directly into the soil, not coming into contact with any above ground growth? And when was the last time irrigation was applied? If you uh, wet the leaves down and there might be a pathogen on there, UV radiation uh, will break pathogens down over time. Keep in mind, water is the vessel of choice for many human pathogens, so appropriate water practices are going to reduce your risk. One thing to keep in mind, and it's not really something that we've had to worry about in our garden, um, this is more, this is a, a big commercial issue though, um, if produce is warmer than the post-harvest water, especially if you have a big old bulk water situation where you, you dump the produce into the the uh, and they submerge it in a tank water can actually cause a vacuum from the the fruit being warmer than the water and there's a vacuum created inside the fruit which will suck in uh, the the wash water as you can see in this photo on the bottom of this cantaloupe uh, the water was dyed green and they washed a warm cantaloupe in cold water and you can see how it sucked in uh, that dyed uh, water. So if you had any contamination in your wash water, you can see how not only is the outside of the fruit potentially contaminated, but now it's moved to the inside of the fruit. Uh, there, there are fruits that are more higher risk than others, tomatoes, cantaloupes, mangoes, uh, and apples, they're all susceptible to this infiltration. However, there are other commodities that are going to be susceptible too. Think about if you have any fruits that have bruises, wounds, or any stem scars, that's another big risk right there. Uh, best practice for this is to maintain the difference in temperature less than about 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for uh, the produce that you bring from the outside and your wash water. That might mean warming up your wash water or cooling your produce before uh, you wash it. The probability of contamination really starts at your source of water and, and probably the lowest risk for all of us is going to be a public water source or municipal water system. Uh, these are uh, monitored for their quality and treated by the municipality. And we presume that this is a source that, that does not present uh, hazards. Although it should be tested if you have reason to believe there's a breach in the service line due to old pipes. Uh, Groundwater, though, as we move down the spectrum of um, higher risk water, is generally believed to be less likely than surface water to have any contamination. Uh, this is due as water filters through layers of soil, clay, and rock, reduces the amount of uh, pathogens or microbial loads associated with that water. 
Now most groundwater we can access through wells, but we can also think of groundwater as springs uh, that can serve as a water source. And because wells vary widely in terms of their quality and construction, it's kind of in the middle of the road here. Surface water uh, is anything that's open or exposed to the environment. This would include rivers, streams, lakes, or ponds. And really the quality of water uh, from surface water can vary greatly. Uh, especially true if you have any contamination events such as a lot of stormwater runoff from uh, surrounding properties uh, that might come from livestock or agricultural operations. Uh, so when it comes to using surface water, uh, really don't recommend it, especially for any type of post-harvest washing unless you treat the water first. A really important point to make here is that if your community garden is maybe more environmentally conscious and, and conserving more water resources and you use something like a rain barrel or some type of rainwater harvesting device, this is considered surface water and that does keep it in that high risk category. You know, if you're, you're thinking you want to test your water, you know, where do you go for um, water testing? And, and one thing to keep in mind, I found through our donation community garden here uh, in Macomb is that some food pantries will not accept washed produce as um, there are quite a bit of fears uh, or they're unsure of what type of water source you were using. Uh, so other food pantries, they might ask you for water testing results. So always check first with your local food pantries before showing up with 50 pounds of tomatoes. Uh, if it's necessary to test your water, I, I do recommend you check first with your local health department. Uh, they might have the test that you require or uh, we'll likely be able to connect you with a lab that does. Our local county health department has a groundwater safety week where they hand out free well water sample kits that check for biological contaminants of well water. Um, I participate in that and what I've learned is that you really have to follow the lab's instructions as it can be very easy to accidentally introduce some bacteria from say your own hand if you accidentally touch the uh, inside of the sample vial or maybe you leave the aerator on your faucet. So make sure you follow uh, all of the sampling, labeling, handling, delivery instructions to the letter. I, I would say it's likely going to happen at some point that your produce will come into contact with water unintentionally. Uh, in our case here, we've had some busted irrigation lines a couple times um, and also a few times where a person has forgotten to turn off uh, the sprinkler, kind of flooded the garden a bit. Um, and we also have flood events that are caused by natural disasters, which can be devastating to a garden. And if a, a harvestable portion of the crop has come into contact with flood water, all of that produce must be discarded. And as was the case of the community garden in this photograph uh, that flooded from a nearby stream. So all the members of this community garden, uh, pretty much the entire season was a total loss. So let's talk a bit about wildlife and domestic animals. Why are they a produce safety concern? Well, because like humans, they carry and spread human pathogens. They are also difficult to control. We have birds and small animals that can often travel unnoticed, and even the best fencing or exclusion tactics can be breached. Wildlife, um, though they might cause a headache sometimes, um, they are a valuable part of our environment and we really should work to protect them. Uh, this is a picture here I snapped of a Cooper's hawk finishing its meal. And so, um, you know, if you're not a chicken producer, birds of prey, snakes, uh, and even uh, other predators like shrews, they pray, play a really good role in controlling other harmful pests. And so we have to really keep in mind that um, there's this, this web of life going on here, and so we do our best not to completely upturn what those processes are. When dealing with wildlife, really the first thing, you have to assess the risk before that first vegetable goes into the ground. In our community garden, which is pictured here, we knew the deer population was high, so fencing was going to be a necessary part of our garden. We know that we wouldn't be able to have a successful garden without a fence. And, and so that's what we did. We built a, a good, strong fence. But also keep in mind, think about any topography or wind patterns, uh, if there's any domestic uh, livestock nearby, uh, animal production, manure storage, which might 
uh, attract uh, either predators or other vermin. And then also think about how uh, wildlife might move through your site uh, and how likely is it that you're going to be encountering uh, fecal contamination. So during the growing season, so you, you've enacted what practices you know to, but during the growing season, you know wildlife uh, will likely make its way into your garden somehow. So monitor for feces and any evidence of intrusion. Um, if there's you know, any fecal contamination, those crops need to be destroyed and gotten rid of. And also make sure that you consider um, other members' observations as well. After harvest, make sure that you look for signs of uh, uh, fecal contamination, any signs of animal activity, such as their scat on the ground, uh, footprints, uh, bird droppings, and then assess any risks and decide if the crop or portion of the crop can be safely harvested. Deterring wildlife is a huge topic of discussion. We could probably spend the next couple hours just talking about deer alone. Uh, however, there's many options to the community garden of, of what you can do to uh, keep wildlife out of the garden or at least deter them from decoys. I would say one of the more successful ones are physical barriers, fencing and netting. Uh, some do turn to noise or visual deterrence. And also when it comes to relocation, uh, just keep in mind a lot of our wildlife are protected by law. And so before you go to relocate any wild animal, it's best to consult with uh, your local state biologist um, or contact your uh, extension office for more information on that process and uh, making sure that you have all of the proper permits to do so. When it comes to pets, we do love them, but they really should be kept out of the community garden and also any type of packing or storage area for produce. Um, advise any community garden volunteers, members, visitors, that they should leave their pets at home. Now we do have a community garden where we have a, a volunteer, she brings her dog, but we have a designated area to stake uh, her dog outside of the garden, away from the garden, away from the main flow of work. And um, also people know that they need to wash their hands every time they would pet the animal and everything like that. And you know, mainly like the dog here uh, in the upper picture, that's Murphy. Uh, he tends to have the nasty habit of rolling in anything that smells bad that he can get his nose into. So always keep in mind, pets are not necessarily the cleanest of animals uh, when we are har uh, harvesting produce and handling food that other people might be consuming. Uh, there's also some gardens I've noticed around the state. They are located in uh, actual zoos and there might be a petting zoo nearby. Always have hand washing sinks available and signage as visitors enter the garden for good food safety practice. Now let's switch to our final main topic here is the handling of our harvested produce. Essentially what we want to think about as we're putting together uh, any SOPs or our strategies for our community garden is where is the food going once it's picked? And uh, additionally, what is that journey gonna be from the field to the fork. As we strive to keep things clean uh, in our post-harvest area where we're gonna be washing all of our veggies, you wanna make sure that we um, consider everything that is going to touch or impact the produce, such as our packing or picking containers, the uh, any equipment, hands and clothing, and even of course the water that we're gonna be using to wash the produce, and of course the coolers, storage areas that we're gonna put them, and also any vehicles that we're gonna be using to transport our produce in. One important um, thing to distinguish is there is a difference between cleaning and sanitizing a surface. And so cleaning is the physical removal of dirt or soil from the surfaces by using clean water and uh, soap. On the other hand, sanitizing, this is treating that surface with the sanitizer, such as chlorine, to reduce or eliminate microorganisms. And my mother, the nurse, uh, always likes to point out that you cannot sanitize a dirty surface. You must always clean it first. So uh, if you have a, a table in your post-harvest area that you wash your veggies on, uh, if you, you wash your veggies and then you just douse it in some chlorine bleach, do you still have some piles of dirt on there? Did you scrape those off? If you didn't scrape those off, guess what? Your table's not clean. So always make sure 
um, to distinguish cleaning versus sanitizing, and good practice is to do both. However, um, you know that's not always possible. Many farms, uh, they might have old or wooden equipment. It's not easy to clean or sanitize. And that's our case here uh, at our Macomb Community Garden. We have just an old wooden table that we use. So all is not lost though. Everything can be cleaned, even, even old equipment. Uh, we do keep our, our tables clean. Um, if possible, we do sanitize. Uh, it's very hard to do that though with wood because wood is a porous surface versus plastic, which all of our containers are plastic that our, our vegetables or produce are in, uh, which we are able to clean, sanitize very easily. Make sure that we have cleaning schedules that are going to reduce contamination risk. For us, it's every time we harvest, uh, it gets cleaned uh, and sanitized. And then also air dry any wooden surface after you wash it. Uh, make sure there's nothing sitting on top of that wooden surface that, that keeps that moisture uh, up against it because then it will seep in there. It's a good place for bacteria and things like that to live. Uh, and be sure that you know, as we upgrade things, any new equipment or buildings are designed to be easily cleaned and sanitized. A major concern when it comes to post-harvest areas are uh, rodents or vermin, uh, birds. So you want to make sure, especially if you have an enclosed uh, wash area, that you inspect all the walls, doors, and windows. If you do have any holes or cracks, you, you caulk and seal those openings. You also want to deter any birds from roosting in the rafters above. Uh, you can use this with nets or the, the bird spikes. Uh, and also make sure that you keep your doors and windows closed as best as you can. Or use screening uh, if you're going to leave those open for prolonged periods of time. You're going to want to have to uh, mow your lawn uh, around that packing area, high, taller, uh, uh, grassy areas tend to hide things like rodents. And then also, if you have any coal piles, and these would be vegetables that didn't make the cut, they're getting tossed out, uh, or garbage, you know, if you, you have those, you want to make sure you get rid of those every day, um, and as needed throughout the day if you're a big garden. And then also, any produce that's going to be going home or to a donation food pantry, make sure you keep that covered to keep any insects off of it. When it comes to the type of bins that we like to use in the community garden, um, want to make sure that they are uh, plastic, which is easy to clean, and also FDA approved for food contact. Want to make sure that we have drain holes in the bottom so that we can avoid any standing water. And I also say a lot of holes on the sides as well for good airflow, uh, for better drying down of the either produce in there or an empty container that's just been washed. Uh, if you are going to be storing produce, uh, you know, you can use a humidifier to increase uh, the humidity in uh, whatever room you're going to be using. Uh, for my case, often I've used uh, plastic, which we perforated, uh, loosely covering the, the bins to kind of keep that humidity up. Now, most community gardens probably won't be doing this, but if you do have a cooler room or a walk-in cooler, uh, you want to also maintain a high relative humidity with that, about 80 to 90 percent, when it is full of produce. And also harvest tools. You've got to make sure that you have a standard operating procedure for cleaning your harvest tools uh, and a good space for storing them out of the way so that they're not contacting any soil or, or water that uh, would be excessive. And so uh, keep it simple. Uh, I really like the setup here on, on the left with uh, the, the shears, the pruning shears, and then the uh, harvest uh, knives right there. So keep it simple, what works for your garden, um, making sure though that you're reducing contamination risk. These are just some examples of some post-harvest areas, some washing areas on the left, a very simple setup is uh, just a computer uh, model right here. You see the canopy, outdoor sink, a couple stainless, a stainless steel area, wash bin. On the right uh, is a bit more uh, elaborate uh, wash station that's that's indoors probably beyond most of what our community gardens will be unless you're a very large one and you're handling a lot of in and out produce in your area again another simple wash station I think more likely what what we're, we're we have um, on the left again just some pop-up canopies got some dunk tanks 
uh, for washing uh, leafy greens and produce. And then on the right, a bit more of a, an established permanent structure here um, with the lean-to. But again, very simple. You can see also how they've covered the ground uh, on the left with wooden boards and on the right with some landscape fabric. Not all produce needs to be washed. Uh, things like berries, grapes uh, are often not washed until right before the, uh, the user is about to consume it. But there are other times such as using dunk tanks. These are incredibly useful uh, in a community garden sense. Now it doesn't have to be these large dunk tanks that we see in these pictures here. What we use in our garden are five gallon buckets full of water. We put our greens in there, we agitate the water with our hands pretty much, and that loosens any dirt, insects that might still be on the greens. And then in addition to cleaning the greens, it also expands and extends the shelf life and the quality of produce. As we get into a bit more uh, established, uh, probably more commercial uh, post-harvest areas, you can see you can you can pretty much go as, as, as high as you want. The uh, image here on the left has two walk-in coolers, uh, some nice wash tables and, and so on. The image on the, the right here has, has roll-up sides uh, for probably good and bad weather conditions. And finally, what we have here are images of just really simple yet effective ways of, of constructing tables for washing produce. The image on the left, you can see it's just made out of uh, these wooden boards. It's about waist high, uh, so you don't have to stoop or bend over in order to work with the veggies here. Uh, you can see the slats in the boards allow for good drainage. The image on the right uh, is a simple setup for uh, washing root vegetables. You see the hardware cloth stretched across allows all any soil that's washed off to fall underneath there. You can either capture that in a bucket system or uh, scoop out the soil once it accumulates, but both very simple, um, highly effective uh, means of constructing a post-harvest wash area for any type of community garden. So that is the uh, end of this session, the final module in the community gardening series. We really did scratch the surface here in uh, food safety uh, risks and safe harvest practices when it comes to community gardens. Uh, when we are speaking with uh, commercial growers, we really do like to spend about a half a day talking about uh, the risks involved in growing produce for market and also the best practices uh, for their own operations. And so if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact your local extension office. You can find us online, uh, on our website, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, all of the social media platforms, and of course, YouTube. Thank you very much for watching this series. From all of us at U of I Extension, have a great day.